Well, good morning, and welcome back to our pilgrimage through the summer. Today is day 23 here at the Institute for Priestly Formation, as well as the Tuesday of the 11th week of Ordinary Time. Um, at IPF this uh, week, of course, we have the two programs running concurrently, the seminar for seminary spiritual directors as they continue to learn more about the specific nuances of how to stay engaged with the spiritual experience of the directee who they are walking with. And, of course, the seminarians in the seminarian program are in their two classes. Uh, the afternoon class is, of course, focused on the spirituality of diocesan priesthood, and the morning class is focused on celibacy and sexuality. In the afternoon class, the seminarians today will learn more about um, their identity as um, a man who has given himself uh, as a spouse to the church, as a spouse to God. And if you follow the natural progression of uh, the way that the natural order uh, progresses, uh, a man is first a son, he grows into being a man, he gives himself to his bride, he becomes a father, and fathers in a particular way. That's really the, the map, you might say, that we use for the seminarians in their spiritual life. That they are first, of course, beloved sons, which I talked about yesterday. And then today we'll talk about their maturing as, uh, as chaste spouses who give themselves freely to the church and to the Lord in celibacy. In the morning class, in uh, celibacy and sexuality, uh, there'll be a great complementarity to the afternoon conversation as we continue to talk about the things that perhaps hold a man back in unfreedom, uh, the things that prevent him from truly be making a gift of himself. And yesterday, the men discussed anger and resentment, and today they'll they'll continue to unpack um, the nuances of that. And the reason we might spend two days on that is just because it's a very influential thing in a man's life. Uh, I think we all have the temptation to hold on to things. And, and because when we hold on to things, they tend to hold on to us. Uh, the men are really encouraged today to, to take a look at uh, anger and resentment, unforgiveness in their past. And so if you were at IPF, we would encourage you to do the same thing. And I know that there was a part of our conversation yesterday as we encouraged you to, to have the courage to look deep within, to ask the Lord, what are the things that bind you in the tomb with Lazarus? Or what are those... Uh, the things that we hold on to using the image of the coconut and the bananas. You know, I think a lot of times people encourage us to let go of things, and, and sometimes that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, I think the reason we hold on to unforgiveness or the reason we hold on to, to anger or resentment is because um, behind the anger and the resentment is pain. And as we try to protect ourselves from the pain or we want to insulate ourselves from the pain, then we hold on to unforgiveness and resentment. A lot of times it's difficult to let go of those things because if we let go of the anger or the resentment or the unforgiveness, then quote-unquote all we'll have left is the pain. All we'll have left is um, the people who hurt us. And if we let go of those things, then there can be a little lie that seeps in and says, look, they, they won the first time when they hurt me, and now they win again because I'm letting go of the only leverage that I had over them. And of course, that's not the voice of truth, nor is that the voice of God, nor is that the voice of freedom, but certainly those are, the I think, some of the reasons why people hold on to things. So, in, in reality, it might be very difficult for you to let go of resentment or anger or unforgiveness, but there is another way. Instead of letting go... Can you let God in? Instead of letting go and, and, and somehow relinquishing the very thing that you've held on to for such a long time, perhaps the first step, not the only step, but perhaps the first step is just letting God in to that place in your heart where you feel like you have to defend yourself or protect yourself. When we're alone there, we, we want to clutch to those things and self-protection. But when we're with the Lord, and we know that He's with us, as the psalm says, in that dark valley, in the shadow of death, when we're not alone, when He's with us, then it's easier for us to, in relationship, relate the things in our heart and then give Him permission to give us the grace to let go. But before we let go, can you let Him in? So today I would encourage you to just simply trust the process and ask God to show you where in your life do you need to let him in. Where are the doors closed in your heart? Where are the places in your own life that you are trying to protect yourself and you need to let the Lord in?
Instead of letting go today, can you let the Lord in? And today we return to John 11, where we prayed yesterday. And again, today I would encourage you to be in the scene, to be Lazarus, you might say, to be the one bound. Ask God to enter your tomb. Let him in. Let him into the places of your heart where you're most bound or most unfree. And trust that he who is the way, the truth, and the life will bring the truth with him. And that that truth will set us free. If only we let him in. God bless you.